Grace, mercy, and peace are yours in abundance from our triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The word of God for our meditation and instruction this morning is taken from St. Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, reading there the first three verses. During those days, another large crowd gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way because some of them have come a long distance. This is the word of our God. In the name of our compassionate Savior Jesus Christ, my dear brothers and sisters. So you're probably aware that the New Testament was originally written in the ancient Greek language. And you may also be aware that we Wells pastors have to study this ancient Greek language in our college and in our seminary as part of our pastoral training so that we are able to work with the New Testament in that original language as we prepare Bible studies and sermons and things like that. Now, I'm going to be really honest with you. Most of us just kind of struggled our way through these Greek classes. Uh, it's challenging. I, I mean, I did okay. I, I made decent grades, but, but I'm no scholar like your pastor, Pastor Zabel. Uh, I, I'm no Greek expert. And I want to be very, very clear about this. I am not qualified to teach Greek to anybody. Having said that, I'd like to teach you a little Greek this morning. <laughs> Specifically, I want to teach you about the Greek word splankna. Splankna. Would you say that with me, please? Splankna. Good, you're speaking Greek already. Splankna is an interesting word. Splankna basically means the stuff that's inside of you right here. It's your entrails, your intestines, your stomach, your guts. Now, why do I tell you about that Greek word? Because it, it plays an important role in the portion of God's word before us this morning. St. Mark uses a verb form of the word splankna, which most English translations translate, I feel compassion, which is a good translation, but, but it's not exactly what the word says. The word is a, a little deeper in meaning and certainly more emotional. It means to feel something right down in your guts. So, for example, you're watching the evening news, and it's some story about a faraway land, a faraway nation that, that is experiencing a terrible famine, and they show you images of the, the ground that's dry and cracked, and they show you images of crops that are withered, that have failed, and then they start showing you pictures of people who are starving, and even children who are starving to death and their eyes are sunken into their heads, and you can make out their ribs and their skulls and their other bones because they're so thin and so frail. And you see those images, and you just, you're moved right down in your guts. You get this sick feeling to your stomach because you feel such compassion for those people. That, by the way, is the same feeling that our Lord Jesus had uh, as he looked at that crowd that had been with him for three days with nothing to eat. He saw their great hunger, and his stomach churned for them. That Jesus' stomach churned for people in need, my friends, is both a, a tremendous comfort to needy sinners like you and me, and it's also a wonderful motivator and model for our lives and for our ministries. Our text for today comes to us from the account of Jesus feeding the 4,000, definitely more than 4,000 people there. That was 4,000 men, maybe something like 20,000 people there. Jesus had spent three days with this large crowd. He had been teaching them about the kingdom. He had been healing their diseases and their sicknesses. And no doubt, after all that hard work, our very human Savior was tired. He needed rest. But he wasn't thinking about his needs. Typically, he was thinking about their needs. After three days with him and having nothing to eat, Jesus was concerned. Some of these people might not have even made it home. They were so hungry, and they had such a long way to go. He heard their growling bellies, and his own stomach churned for them. He was filled with compassion for that crowd. Have you ever felt that way when you saw someone in need, just filled with compassion for them? Of course you have. But let me ask a harder question this morning. Have you ever seen someone in need, and you didn't, really feel compassion for them. Maybe you're in the big city, 
and you see that panhandler with his hand out, and as you walk by, you're thinking to yourself, come on, buddy, get a job. Your stomach churns more with annoyance than with compassion. Maybe you come to the end of the exit ramp, and there standing in the median is one of those people with the cardboard sign that says, please help, and so you discreetly pull to the other lane and roll up your window, and certainly don't make eye contact. Has a thought like this ever wormed its way into your head? Hey, buddy, you are there by your own fault. That's how you got into that situation. I'm not going to help you. You made your bed. Now you can lie in it. I've had thoughts like that, friends, more often than I would care to admit. Now, I'm not suggesting that handing a $20 bill to the panhandler is always the best way to help him. What I'm saying is that we sometimes have a serious attitude problem, don't we? I mean, sometimes we view the people of this world who are, are struggling in some way as nothing more than an annoyance, a blight on society, just a bunch of losers who need to get their act together. But you know something? Our Lord Jesus never thought about anybody that way. And we are his followers. We are the followers of the one who is the very embodiment of compassion, and yet sometimes our lack of compassion is just stunning. This is what St. John wrote in his first epistle. He said, If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Too often we have done our best impression of the priest or the Levite walking by on the other side of the road. Too often we have demonstrated a disturbing lack of love. Too often our stomachs have just failed to churn with compassion for others. And that's why the picture that we have before us in our text of our Savior this morning is so profoundly comforting. Just look at him. What magnificent compassion. What perfect mercy. He saw those people's deep need and his compassionate heart was moved to compassionate action. You know the rest of the story. In the feeding of the 4,000, Jesus used his almighty power. He multiplied the bread. He multiplied the fish. He fed that huge crowd. He met their need. And my friends, the same churning stomach, the same compassion-filled heart has moved our Savior to meet our greatest need, humanity's greatest need, the deep need for forgiveness. Jesus looked at us and never once did he think, well, it's your own fault. You made your bed, now you can lie in it. Even though that's true, Jesus' thoughts went more like this. My life for their lives. My death for their salvation. And so Jesus, in unmatched compassion, left his holy throne in heaven above and was born of the lowly virgin so that he could walk in this world in our place as our substitute. Jesus, in unmatched compassion, walked perfectly in our place under God's law. A life of perfect love, a life of perfect compassion, a life that counts for you and me as if we are the ones who lived it. Jesus, in unmatched compassion, came down from that glorious mount of transfiguration and entered the valley of the deepest suffering. He willingly, resolutely went to the cross and he stretched out his arms. And when he did so, he received both the Roman nails and the divine punishment for our sins. He shed blood that is so pure, so priceless, so precious, that it doesn't just cleanse you and me of our sins, it cleanses the entire world of sin. It washes away all our apathy, all our lack of love and compassion. It's all gone in Jesus' blood. Jesus, in unmatched compassion, came out of that tomb fully bodily alive on the third day. And when he did that, my friends, he put the exclamation point on both his victory and our victory. We have forgiveness and life and salvation through our crucified and our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. What a great comfort it is to know that our Savior's heart churns with compassion for us and that that compassion moved him to saving action for us. You know something, friends? Jesus' compassionate heart, his churning stomach, is still motivating compassionate action. It's motivating you and me to compassionately act for others, to help our neighbors with their physical needs. You know, I think if we took a, a poll 
little survey after church this morning, not only here at St. Peter and Clovis, but, but really in any Christian congregation around the country. We just asked people as they were leaving, hey, which is it, A or B? A, Jesus is concerned with our souls, or B, Jesus is concerned with our bodies. I honestly think we would almost by instinct want to answer immediately, well, it's, it's A, Jesus is concerned with my soul. That's why he came to save my soul. Our text today speaks to this, doesn't it? Which is it? A, Jesus is concerned with our souls, or B, Jesus is concerned with our bodies. I think you know very well that the answer is yes. Jesus is concerned with all of us, both soul and body. He created us soul and body. He redeemed us soul and body by his precious blood. But in our text for today, Jesus' compassion is rather pointed. He says, I have compassion for these people. And in this case, he's really referring to their physical need. He's talking about their hunger. You see, the one who knit us together wonderfully in our mother's wombs cares about those bodies that he created. Not only does he care about them, but he takes care of them, doesn't he? He acts, he provides, he gives us the things that we need for our bodies. And friends, that's inspiring to us, isn't it? There are dozens and dozens of passages in the scriptures that exhort us in our Savior's name to do those kinds of things, to care for people's needs to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to visit prisoners, to take care of widows and orphans, and so on and so forth. Martin Luther summarized it all beautifully when he said we should help and befriend our neighbor in every bodily need. But again, I have to say, there's just something special about what Jesus does in our text. He is moved to deep compassion simply because the people were hungry. Isn't that marvelous? Isn't it wonderful to know that Jesus cares about the so-called little things like that? And it's not just marvelous, my friends. It's motivating, right? It's inspiring. It lights a fire under us to help our neighbors in need. And of course, there are just all kinds of ways that we can do this. There are all kinds of ways that you already do this in your own lives as you, you care for your, your family, your friends, your loved ones, your neighbors. You see a need and you, you want to help. You do what you can to assist them. And I'm sure there are ways that as a congregation, you reach out into your community and help people who are hurting in some way. This morning, I want to tell you just a little bit about a, a ministry of compassion that helps people in need, one that I, I am privileged to be involved with, the ministry of Wells Christian Aid and Relief, which is one of our synod's compassion ministries. Uh, on your behalf and with your vigorous volunteer efforts and your generous support, we strive to carry out a ministry that, that helps people in need, a ministry that has a, a churning stomach of compassion for people. And we do that through three main activities, disaster relief, humanitarian aid, and personal relief grants. And I'm going to summarize those three areas for you real briefly here from the pulpit this morning. I'm going to give you the Cliff Notes version, um, but I hope you'll join us during the adult Bible study hour this morning. Uh, so I can tell you more about this ministry and show you some pictures and, and see the amazing work uh, that our Lord uh, allows us to do and gives us the privilege of doing. So first of all, disaster relief. When there is a hurricane, a tornado, a fire, a flood, an earthquake, whatever it may be, and it, it impacts a community where we have a Wells congregation, we work together with the members of that congregation. We come in and we help that community and the neighbors of the church to rebuild and restore everything after that disaster. We do that by, by providing things like trained volunteer labor, leadership, logistics, equipment, funding, whatever is needed uh, to take care of those people who are hurting. But here's the thing about disaster relief. When somebody has been through a disaster, they've really been through a trauma. It's really terrifying for people, and they're hurting after that disaster. So we train our volunteers to spend as much time as they can with the people that they're helping, talking to them, listening to their story, and as God gives opportunity, sharing with them the greatest comfort that anybody can receive, and that's the good news of our Savior Jesus. Secondly, humanitarian aid. We work together with our partners at Wells Home and World Missions to help people with basic needs that they have, uh, these people who are located in our mission fields here in America, and, and all across the world. And I really am talking about basic needs. I'm talking about food for the hungry and water for the thirsty 
and medical care for the sick and the dying, mosquito netting for people who live in areas where malaria is a big problem, uh, school supplies and backpacks for underprivileged kids, and just a host of other kinds of needs like that. Here's the neat thing that happens. As we work with those people and, and carry out these little acts of compassion, providing things that they need, it builds relationships. It builds trusting relationships between our missionaries and the people that they serve. And so it leads, again, to lots of opportunities to talk about the one in whose name we are showing them that compassion. Finally, personal relief grants. When somebody in one of our congregations whether it's a member of the congregation or a prospective member of the congregation, is going through some crisis in life. Uh, maybe it's a, a family that has a child that needs surgery. The surgery is $60,000. They don't have the insurance for it. Uh, or maybe it's an elderly couple that desperately need a new roof over their heads and they can't get it done physically or financially. In cases like that, when it goes beyond the ability of the congregation to meet the need, we work together with that church and, and help them meet uh, the needs of those folks. And, and I'll let you in on a little secret this morning. Doing this kind of work is hard. Sometimes it can even be heartbreaking. But it's also fun. It's rewarding. It feels good to do this kind of stuff. But that's not why we do it. We don't carry out these acts of compassion for any kind of personal glory or selfish gain. We do it for the glory of our Savior God alone in thanks for his saving love in Christ and for the benefit of precious souls and bodies for whom our Savior set, shed his priceless blood. So let's finish up our Greek lesson, shall we? Say it with me one more time. Splankna. What a wonderful word. Friends, may it always remind you that, that we have a Savior whose stomach churns with compassion for people in need. With grateful hearts, may our stomachs always do the same. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We join to confess our faith in the ancient and beautiful words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, we gather our thank offering.